Good afternoon, everyone, especially if you're on the East Coast, I guess, and welcome all wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Tammy Kim, and I'm a contributing opinion writer at The New York Times and a former lawyer for immigrant workers. It's my great pleasure to moderate today's event on Immigration Matters, hosted by New America and The New Press. The occasion for this conversation is the paperback release of a new book here, Immigration Matters, Movements, Visions, and Strategies for a Progressive Future. But we also happen to be meeting at a critical time in the world of immigration policy and immigrants' rights. We are, of course, nearly a year out of the Trump administration, so bald-faced in a xenophobia and racism and deliberate mismanagement of the pandemic. The past four years unveiled for many of us the architecture of state control and catalyzed the Black Lives Matter solidarity movements of last summer. All of us who care about civil and human rights had high hopes for the Biden administration, which has, to its credit, enacted some great reforms. But in the last few weeks, we have also seen images circulate of Customs and Border Patrol agents brutalizing Haitian people seeking asylum in Texas. And we continue to read about the separation of families and the lockdown of the border, ostensibly based on the public health threat of COVID-19. Where does the immigrant rights movement, with its many priorities in politics, go from here? I'm grateful to this new book, Immigration Matters, for giving a much needed overview of immigration past and present. It's a wide ranging edited volume that collects chapters from historians and sociologists, political scientists, activists, organizers, and policymakers. It busts myths about migration and the stories we tell ourselves about America. It challenges us to be more sensible and perhaps more imaginative in how we go about what we call immigration reform please do buy a copy of the book, which you can see linked at the bottom right of your screen. Today, we will hear from three contributors to Immigration Matters, New America Senior Advisor Cecilia Munoz, George Mason Professor Justin Guest, and City University of New York Professor Ruth Milkman, who is also one of the editors of the book. In terms of structure for today, each panelist will speak for a few minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. As we go, please feel free to type your questions into Slido, the box located to the right of the video on your screen. Closed captioning is available by hovering over the video and clicking CC at bottom. Our first speaker will be Cecilia Munoz, a senior advisor at New America and a member of the Biden-Harris transition team who previously worked as President Obama's Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Before that, she spent two decades at the National Council La Raza, now known as Unidos US. Cecilia will give us an overview of her chapter of the book, which lays out strategies for change, the border and beyond. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Tammy, and thank you to everybody who is participating. We're so glad to have you here. You know, I was reflecting um, on what it felt like to be writing about the border. This, the, the writing of the book happened, of course, um, long before the election, we didn't know what the outcome would be. And I thought it would be, it was a timely issue at the time. I suspected it would be a timely issue shortly after the inauguration, uh, which turned out to be true. Um, and of course, in, in this moment where we're having this conversation, it remains very, very timely, um, you know, frustratingly so. Um, so the chapter in the book really outlines a little bit about why we are in the situation that we are. Um, but it also has some specific recommendations and I'm gonna spend my minute focusing on those. The first really is that it is essential that we recognize and think of what's happening at the border as not just a border situation. It's really the result of what an unacknowledged refugee crisis in our hemisphere. And you can't fix a refugee crisis at the border. There, there, you will, the government will never have the tools to address a refugee crisis at the border. And so we, it, it's it, tremendously important that we recognize as a society the reasons that people are leaving and that we engage in a muscular way in our own hemisphere uh, in order to address the reasons people migrate in the first place, which sounds like a, a possibly a crazily tall order. It is not. It has just been the subject of, of um, at least neglect as well as you know, arguably some, some really quite negative behavior by the United States over many years. This is something we can address and we have to if we expect to have a manageable situation at the border. So that's recommendation number one. The second is that our, our border, the, all of the infrastructure at the US-Mexico border from the, the, the laws and the policies and the regulatory policy 
to the actual physical infrastructure, border patrol facilities and the facilities that near them and around and around them, to the personnel that that people encounter when they cross the border. All of that was designed for a border that we no longer have. It was designed for a situation from decades ago when the primary challenge was single adults coming from Mexico. That's not what we're seeing at the US-Mexico border any longer. We're seeing families from Central America and you know, famously and importantly in the last few weeks from Haiti and other places. Um, our infrastructure, the laws, nothing is suited for the migration of families from a non-contiguous country, which is very much what we're seeing. Um, importantly, the Biden administration is moving towards something that, that the book recommends, which is to create a situation where we are much more expeditiously able to process people's asylum claims. Right now, the way it works is people who are, are arriving, if they are allowed to present the possibility of an asylum claim, they end up waiting years for a hearing uh, uh, within the United States, which is a system which doesn't deliver them an answer expeditiously and doesn't deliver the kind of orderliness that I think Americans uh, have come to expect at the border. Um, the Biden administration is moving uh, it, by promulgating regulations to address this, to essentially move the system out of the courts and into the, the an, an asylum core, a well-trained asylum core, which hopefully will be able to um, address asylum claims more expeditiously. This is really essential um, because the pressure on the border is not going to abate the situation. Even if we invest in, in, in the short term, the situation in the uh, driving migration isn't going to change. It is really imperative that we have an asylum system that properly houses people, addresses their humanitarian needs, their needs as fellow human beings, and answers the question, which is the government's job to answer, which is do they qualify for asylum or not under the, uh, uh, under the legal regime. The third recommendation, and I'll stop with this, has to do with the legal regime itself. Um, our asylum system was built largely for, for the Cold War. It was also not built for what we're seeing now. We are really seeing only the beginning of climate migration, both in the migration of Haitians, but also in the migration of Central Americans. Um, that is the, the, the tip of the proverbial iceberg. If obviously, the planet will see much more climate migration in the future, and we're not ready for it in the United States, and we're not ready for it across the, the globe. Among many other things that will require in the United States a reckoning with uh, our own policies and attitudes about whom we choose to protect. We have a, a, a pretty antiquated um, asylum system. We have not had a reckoning or a conversation about really the conditions of, of the bulk of the people who are presenting themselves at the US-Mexico border. Um, and while there are many Americans who feel extraordinary compassion and, and rightly so, and extraordinary outrage at the treatment, for example, of the Haitian migrants from a week or two ago, that is um, as it should be. But what we're not having is a conversation about, about who we should welcome. And I say this as the co-founder of something called welcome.us, which came together to mobilize people around resettling people from Afghanistan who, were, um, who helped the United States and our troops over the last 20 years. The whole idea is to get civil society involved both in the actual resettlement of people and in the conversation about who should be resettled in the United States and how we might connect with them. And let me stop with that and hand it back to you, Gary. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Appreciate that. Our next speaker will be Justin Guest, an Associate Professor of Policy and Government at the Shar School of George Mason University. Justin is the author of several books, including Crossroads, Comparative Immigration Regimes in a World of Demographic Change. His chapter in Immigration Matters explores future policy directions and is entitled, When Democrats Are Not the Party of Ideas. Thank you for being here, Justin. Thanks so much for having me and for inviting me. And uh, it was a pleasure to be a part of this book uh, which reflects uh, Ruth and Deepak Bhargava's and, and Penny's vision, uh, you know, I think uh, for, for a different future for American immigration. So it's wonderful to be beside you all and, and, and also Cecilia as well. Um, so what I want to do is, you know, my, my chapter uh, ranges because it's truly a, a sort of critique uh, of immigration politics in the United States. Um, but I want to you know, reflect on the current situation we're in and, and where my ideas uh, might be helpful. Um, I think it's 
fair to say right now that no matter what side of the aisle someone is on, uh, things are not going well with American immigration politics. It's a tough moment in history right now after a tough four years. Um, you know, we have obviously the crisis at our southern border that Cecilia has just uh, depicted uh, really astutely. Um, we have the lingering issue of undocumented immigrants in the United States, which appears the Democrats in Congress are not going to be able to legislate uh, on via budget reconciliation. Uh, and that's uh, in itself already an act of desperation. And we have the usual um, uh, stalemate as it relates to the need for labor in the country, uh, the desire to reunify with family, enormous backlogs for both admission and, and visas, and also citizenship applications. Uh, it's a really, really m just a mess right now. Um, and, and that's not necessarily attributable to the Biden administration, which is still relatively new. Uh, it's, a, it's a product of decades of what I call policy formaldehyde, uh, simple inaction um, because of the sort of stalemate uh, that immigration has, uh, has been subject to. And what we're really uh, conscious of, I think, is that the, the refugee crisis that Cecilia mentions is, is in some ways a refugee crisis, except that if only it were, it would be a lot easier. The problem is that so many people that are trying to enter the United States at our southern border right now do not qualify as refugees, which makes the situation so much harder because they are forced migrants, but they don't necessarily qualify according to international standards, let alone our own national standards. And so, you know, this has complicated our efforts. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that what's also complicating our efforts is that this is a challenge of governance, not just of external forces, but actually our internal ability to govern the country. Um, and what we're stuck with right now is this enduring equilibrium between the two major political parties. On the one hand, you have Republicans, which have lots of ideas. Uh, there's lots of ideas on the right right now about what to do about immigration, and all of them are driven by restrictionism, intolerance, outright nationalism, and are really unhealthy for the country more broadly, particularly given our demographic aging, our voracious appetite for labor and innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and, and our human, humanitarian interest in maintaining the sort of mission of the United States since our founding. On the other side, on the left, uh, Democrats have very few ideas right now. I think the Democrats are, are, have few ideas precisely because they can't actually rally around any major ideas. It's a party that's fractured. Uh, you have three basic factions on the left right now. You have uh, the sort of uh, pro-business organizations that are sort of in some ways commoditizing immigration as a human resource that they need. You have immigrant rights movement, which is mostly mobilizing around the undocumented and, and to a certain extent family reunification. And then you also have the sort of cosmopolitan foreign policy elites uh, that are pushing hard for broadening uh, uh, refugee migration to the country and some of our international obligations. Um, the result has been a party that is largely retrenched. Uh, the, the, their decision has basically been just keep the system as it is and just focus on sort of key things that we can all agree upon. And the one thing that everyone on the left can agree upon right now is improving the plight of the undocumented, a really noble mission and certainly one that has uh, incredible urgency to it at this point in our history. And yet that has also become the fulcrum, I think, of partisanship in the United States. It is precisely what motivates Republicans against the Democratic Party. It is, it is inflammatory. And it's basically become uh, the sort of red line for so many Republican legislators, uh, legislators in Congress. And so that really poses an enormous challenge when we are so retrenched. And yet the one thing that everyone can agree upon is actually uh, a, 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 a no-go zone. Um, and so this is also, I think, um, really uh, uh, deepened and compounded by the intensity gap across left and right. So while most Democrats can agree that immigration is good for the country, that we are a nation of immigrants, and that we want to continue this legacy going forward, the problem is that the belief, the passion for that issue is really subordinate to Democrats' passion for other issues right now. Climate change, healthcare provision, public health, inequality and poverty, racial justice are all way higher on the sort of list of hierarchy of uh, on the hierarchy of American policy problems right now. On the right, on the other hand, immigration is frequently number one. It, uh, for at least a quarter and possibly a third of Republicans, immigration is the number one issue this country is facing. And so this intensity gap has led to a, a, a strange kind of contortion of politics where Democrats are just happy to leave the current system as it is, despite its obviously glaring inadequacies. So what I wanna conclude with um, is to touch on what we can learn, I think, from the Afghan airlift. 
from which uh, Cecilia also mentioned in her remarks. So what I think we can take away from this uh, was it, it really was a, a remarkable, I think, moment, uh, just sort of a, a new cycle in American history. But it was remarkable because you saw people left and right, you know, uh, deeply religious evangelicals and churches, uh, you know, uh, big business and corporations, average Americans, middle class folks in the suburbs, actually really with an outpouring of care and consideration about refugees, a group that has been, you know, subject to vilification. Uh, and, and real doubt about their belonging in the United States historically, uh, at least recently. And what you saw was a rallying around that these, this is a group of people who we must protect. This is an imperative that we must deal with uh, and, and a shaming of the Biden administration at one point for not doing enough to prepare for their arrival in the United States. And this of course story will continue to go on. But what I think we can take away from this is that there are two components of the Afghan airlift that really should be a lesson to all of us in the immigration policy and politics world. The reason we were able to get a sense of consensus over among people who are normally quite restrictionist and restrictive about their immigration views is that there were two components. One, there was a sense that the United States was in control of the operation. It, they were vetting people closely. We knew the people who were coming in. There was a sense of familiarity with the potential new Americans who are going to arrive. And second, that doing so was in the national interest. These are folks who had nearly given their lives and some people in some cases uh, did give their lives uh, uh, and, and, and were subject to bodily harm and, and, and family harm for a country that they had never actually stepped foot in, for a country that they never fully knew. It was for an idea that is America. And that national interest and that sense of control was what opened the gates, I think, of Americans and opened the, the way to their hearts and actually uh, creating a sort of consensus immigration issue. So I think that the challenge has to be to identify ways to actually put things in the American interest, but also demonstrate a sense of control without necessarily using the draconian policies of the Trump administration, but demonstrating that the federal government is actually a good manager of this system, which right now, in the, in the times that we are looking at right now, it just doesn't look that way. And I think that is our challenge for the future, to demonstrate good governance, good management, and then ask the American people to reconsider more restrictionist, uh, restrictionist views. Thank you for that political overview, Justin. Our final speaker will be Ruth Milkman, distinguished professor at the City University of New York's Graduate Center and the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Ruth has written widely on many aspects of labor and labor movements, including women workers, immigrant workers, and the gig economy. In addition to editing Immigration Matters, she recently published a volume called Immigrant Labor and the New Precariat. Today, she will discuss her chapter, History Shows That the Immigrant Threat Narrative is Wrong. I'll turn it over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Tammy, and um, thanks everyone for being here. So in contrast to what Justin just described in regard to the public consensus across the aisle about the Afghan refugee situation. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the opposite. It's, a, it's probably the third rail of the Im immigration conversation and the one that um, animates the Republican passion that Justin mentioned a minute ago, um, namely the view that immigrants and especially low wage immigrants are a threat to the American economy, to American culture, to uh, taxpayers, and you know, because they are burdened with costs that they wouldn't otherwise have if folks like that weren't in the country. Um, so I call that, and um, others do too, the the immigrant threat narrative: the idea that um, immigration is a threat rather than an opportunity or a benefit um, to the United States. And I try to um, focusing on the labor side of that. I try to look at the problem from with a historical lens, looking at um, what is the process through which low wage immigrants um, become part of our labor force? And, you know, is it damaging to US born workers? And um, what I try to show, well, there are two threads to it. First, um, in industries like construction, short haul trucking, um, meat packing, there is a dynamic through which the, the sequence of events is this. Employers take steps to attack unions, degrade jobs, cut costs, especially labor costs, um, which leads to deterioration in working conditions, um, 
benefits evaporate, things like pensions that used to be standard in those kinds of industries. Um, and then US born workers in, in these industries, mostly that means US born men, white men actually, though not in meatpacking, but in construction and trucking, that is who used to be in the labor force. They look at what's going on in the industry and they say, I'm not doing this anymore, not under, not under this regime. You know, I, I, I'm happy to do it if I have a pension plan and I get paid by the hour and I make a decent living, but not anymore. And they move to other kinds of jobs that are still um, viewed as desirable. I should mention there's a lot of turnover in the labor market anyway, so people are moving around all the time, but this is one of the drivers of it in those industries. And then employers are faced with vacancies, labor shortages. By the way, we do have a lot of labor shortages right now, not necessarily in all these industries, but it's not irrelevant to what I'm talking about. Um, and then um, employers turn to immigrants, often recruiting them from across the US-Mexico border. Um, historically, that there's been a lot of that, not right now. Um, so, so immigrants essentially do replace the U.S. born workers, but the but it's that it's it's due to the actions of employers to degrade jobs. So that's one thread, and the other is a little different, and it involves um, mostly female workers in the care work sector. Um, and my starting point there is just to point out that those jobs weren't degraded particularly in, in the neoliberal era. They were already horrible jobs. They never paid well, they never had unions, they never had benefits, et cetera. Um, and they were dominated historically, these, this work was done by African-American women. But then something changed in the 1970s, the same time, by the way, that employers went on the war path um, in those other sectors I was just talking about, just alongside that in, um, the 1970s, thanks to the civil rights movement and especially the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, um, African-American women suddenly have access to a much bigger variety of jobs than they historically had. And they rapidly abandon domestic work and things like home care um, and move into clerical jobs, service jobs, sales jobs that had always been um, female dominated, but previously all white or almost all white. Um, and meanwhile, as inequality grows in this period since the 1970s, and as the population ages, and as more mothers enter the labor force and need more domestic services or think they need them, um, the demand for paid domestic labor skyrockets and for home care. Um, and so, there's, so that's when um, people start hiring immigrants for those jobs. We think of them now as kind of prototypical immigrant jobs, but it was not always so. Um, so there, there's no story of degradation, but the, the process is similar. Exodus of US born workers and um, immigrant workers um, filling the, the resulting vacancies. Um, so my view is that um, my conclusion from all this is two things really, and we can discuss the details more if people are interested. Um, one is that immigration policy is, and, and immigration dynamics are inextricably entwined with labor policy and labor market dynamics. I think you can see that from just these two sketches I just offered. Um, and also that US born workers have every reason to be enraged about the situation they face, especially non-college educated workers in today's labor market, but they should be targeting that rage, not at immigrants, but that at employers who have degraded jobs and at policymakers who have um, increased inequality. Um, so I'll just stop there. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you all to the attendees who are here with us. Um, just a reminder, please do insert your questions in the Slido box, which should be towards the right bottom of the video. Um, I have prepared some questions for our uh, wonderful panelists, and I'll just go in uh, reverse chronological order and then um, ask some general questions, and we eagerly await a mass of uh, attendee questions. So, Ruth, on this labor question, um, I'm curious if you could say a little bit about the role that large unions and union confederations have played in shaping immigration policy. Um, I think some of our um, audience will know that um, the relationship was not always a rosy one. Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, actually, inside the US labor movement, the, what I 
started with the immigrant threat narrative was pervasive in the 70s and 80s. That's how most unionists saw immigrants as a threat to their own livelihoods. Um, by the end of the 20th century, that had changed. And the AFL-CIO began to do, they did a basically 180 degree turn in the year 2000, putting out a statement saying that they were eager to um, contribute to policies that would help legalize undocumented immigrants who were already in the United States and promoting immigrant rights and all kinds of other arenas. So that was a big reversal. And um, I'm, I wouldn't, well, and, and they did become in the, well, okay, so that's 2000. That reflects a lot of um, immigrant worker organizing that unions engaged in in the 1990s. To everyone's surprise, I think including some of the organizers themselves, um, this was not as difficult as they anticipated. Immigrants eagerly um, embraced opportunities to unionize, which if you think about it, it makes sense. Most low-wage immigrants, this is, come to this country because they wanna advance themselves economically. So there's not that much union organizing these days and there wasn't even in the 90s, though there was more then than now. When someone offers a helping hand and said, hey, you wanna get together and, you know, it, it's a very welcome thing, perhaps more so than famously individualistic um, U.S. born workers in, in many cases. So, so that was quite successful in the 1990s and that's what helped lead to the policy reversal um, so that the labor movement began to see immigrants as kind of a prime target in terms of new organizing instead of as a threat to their existing membership. Um, and then certain unions, especially the ones that had done that, um, I'm thinking of especially the service employees union um, SEIU and the um, HERE, now called Unite Here, the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. Um, and they really became very central to the immigration policy discussions and, and um, mobilizations of the first decade of this century. Um, then in 2008, everything sort of falls apart with the Great Recession, where immigrants basically stop coming and the nation is preoccupied with other things. So we haven't heard so much from um, labor on this topic since then, but that's the, that's a uh, potted history. <laughs> Thank you. That's really helpful. Justin, on, on the political question, I'm curious, um, you in your chapter incorporate some research you've done um, comparatively across countries on um, regulation of national um, immigrants, and you find that the US has some, some unusual features. Um, what are those features? And um, you, ad why do you advocate for something you call immigration money ball? Maybe you could explain that briefly. <laughs> Of course, happy to. And uh, what I'll do is I'll post uh, a link to the article that that uh, idea comes from, uh, which was a piece in Politico uh, from a couple of years back uh, on immigration moneyball. Um, so, you know, this is a, I'll have to give a very short version uh, of all this, but the US is a rogue immigration country. You know, after, after a, almost a century of sort of being the standard bearer uh, after 1882, when we first federalized immigration, um, the U.S. is now exceptional uh, and not always for the best reasons. Uh, and that's mostly because of, of the stalemate that I mentioned in my opening remarks. Um, our immigration policy is largely unchanged since 1986 and fundamentally unchanged since uh, the Immigration Naturalization Act of 1965. Um, we just haven't had any major overhauls of the system. And so we are you know, outdated in many ways compared to what other countries now do on immigration in order to advance their national interests um, for commercial reasons and also for economic reasons and also for, uh, to address demographic aging. So the, the, the fundamental reasons why we look different is that unlike any other country in the world, we emphasize family migration uh, in our permanent visas. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a very humane way of running immigration, but it's also not a very, very good way of targeting skills uh, whether low or high skilled individuals that help fill labor gaps and labor shortages. It's also not a very good way of helping to fuel um, economic rebirths and development in some of the more rural parts of the country, which could use the extra help because of demographic aging and also because of departures to, uh, to more urban areas. It's just a very untargeted way of, of welcoming immigrants. 65% um, of all permanent migration to the United States is on family visas. Uh, and that is almost double the next nearest country in the world. I mean, that's just remarkable if you think about it. Uh, the next, in case you're worried, wondering, it's, it's, uh, it's France and Ireland that are in the mid-30s. Um, so 65 is a big number. 
The other thing that makes us unique is uh, our, our structural reliance on the undocumented. So what you do see around the world right now is an interest in short-term labor migration, contract labor, temporary labor visas. Uh, they make up about 50% of all visas in the top 30 destination states worldwide. We don't really have a lot of temporary labor migration to the United States. We have some programs, but it's not as nearly as wide as some of our peer countries like Canada or the UK or Australia, uh, which really emphasize this. And so um, we have actually relied on de facto temporary labor migration in the form of undocumented people who, of course, uh, whose status is in the shadows and can be uh, exploited and are highly vulnerable. That's no way to run and manage a migration system. And so those are the two principal ways that we look strange. Um, while the rest of the world is actually developing very sophisticated ways uh, to both open their borders to more immigrants uh, and also be more selective about them. And, uh, and of course, my other work details a variety of ways we can do that, including money ball migration. Um, and the money ball idea in, in very brief is basically the, the, a way to apply the logic of data analytics that you see in the, in the sports world uh, to the migration. So instead of picking you know, a defenseman or, or a first baseman or a point guard, you know, we're picking engineers and we're picking entrepreneurs and we're picking uh, software programmers and we're picking math teachers. These are who we need to be picking and how can we leverage analytics to do that? There are key ways if we were to collect the right data and then leverage it in our immigration selection. Uh, and that would allow us to welcome more immigrants because it gives that same sense of control that I emphasize so much in my opening remarks. Great, thank you for that. And maybe we can circle back to uh, the low wage worker part of that money ball equation as well. Sure. Um, Cecilia, um, I've, I've recently read some articles observing that at the start of the Biden administration, immigration detention was actually at, at quite a low, but has since risen. Um, I'm curious what you make of this and what some acceptable alternatives to incarceration might be for immigrants. Yeah, it's a great question. It, that's it, in some ways that relates to the earlier point I made about the, the tools that are available at the border are just not being the right tools. And one of those, right, that's been used for, for a long time, facilities in, in which the federal government has invested are detention facilities. And there are some circumstances where the law actually requires detention um, on the assumption that it will act as a deterrent to, to future people trying to come. And of course, there's really no evidence that that's true and there's increasingly evidence that is not true. In fact, in some ways, if the, if the four years of the Trump administration doing all of the harshest things they could imagine to migrants, including taking their children, um, and, and the fact that none of that actually served as a deterrent suggests that the notion that like the whole house of cards needs to fall, that this notion that, um, that whatever the decisions the United States makes at the border act, can actually act as a deterrent to migration because it's pretty definitively proved not to be true. Um, so uh, I would love to see an environment this would require uh, you know, action by Congress, which is something that you know, isn't forthcoming in these days, but I would love to see an environment, particularly as it relates to the folks who are coming forward and asking for asylum in which we provide sort of a community-based approach to housing them while they are waiting for their, the answers to their asylum claims, which under the regulatory regime that I described could happen relatively expeditiously. That is a completely different approach. It's used in some parts of Europe, um, but the idea is that you know, the government's job is to sort among the people who present themselves at the border, who is eligible for to entry and protection in the United States and who is not. I mean, I think we should change the rules around who is and who isn't, but with whatever set of rules we're talking about, it makes sense to allow folks to enter, provide them with um, uh, access to a community and housing and humane conditions um, that acknowledge their circumstances and, and including acknowledging the fact that many of them will have endured trauma. Um, uh, get them an answer to their asylum petition expeditiously. And then if the answer is yes, they go on their way in the United States. And then they, if the answer is no, we need the infrastructure to return people humanely, which is something that we don't do well at all in the United States. Again, most recently and horrifyingly by sending people back to Haiti and quite literally throwing their belongings on the tarmac. Um, but so there's a, a lot that needs to change. There is a different 
vision for how we might use facilities at the border, but that suggests a different kind of facility and really from beginning to end a different kind of approach. And one that is, I would hope a little bit more worthy of who we are as the United States. Thank you for that. I'm going to um, bring in a couple of audience questions here. Um, Justin, I might turn this one to you. Um, one of the audience members wants to know how industries that profit from migrant labor relate to the historically pro-business Republican Party's nativist turn. Um, and I might just inject here, I mean, maybe you could speak to, um, you know, poultry, the poultry plants or, uh, you know, the farms where immigrant workers have, have supplied that labor for many decades now. And uh, the fact that uh, the owners of those, uh, those um, businesses often are um, very much in the Republican Party. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. It's, it's actually really something that would be good for Ruth to talk about, actually, as well, um, because this is a, a little bit more up her alley. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just contextualize Ruth's response by saying that um, the realignment of American partisan politics um, that we have witnessed basically since the 1990s uh, into the into the 20 teens um, is in many ways uh, encapsulated by immigration. Um, because rather than seeing a sort of left-right spectrum, I think the parties are now increasingly on an open, closed spectrum. You know, one is obviously more nationalistic, nostalgic, uh, and, and retrenchist, whereas the Democrats are obviously more liberal, more cosmopolitan, uh, and, and, and more open. And so immigration is the perfect expression of this. And a lot of those pro-business organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, lots of business owners and, 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 uh, and, and, and people who employ a lot of uh, laborers, um, previously affiliated very closely with the Republican Party, um, on this issue, the Republicans are no longer with them, no matter what, how strong the business interests are. It was very clear from Donald Trump's 2018 attempt uh, to uh, float a new immigration bill um, via Jared Kushner's team, uh, that anything that, that kept the status quo in terms of the number of immigrants coming into the country was dead on arrival with Republicans. And of course, that bill was also dead on arrival with Democrats for a variety of reasons as well. Um, so the party realignment has completely adjusted these coalitions. Now, that's not to say that you don't have a lot of business owners who are still Republican, and many of them may even be nativistic in, in, uh, uh, in their views and nationalistic in their views. Um, but it basically means that they're not as aligned on immigration as they once were before. Uh, and it's mostly because immigration has become that central fulcrum where everything else is sort of, you know, uh, uh, revolving around. I mean, it is really a way of predicting people's views on a variety of other national uh, matters if you can know how they feel about immigration. Um, in terms of, you know, the actual management of labor, I'm going to actually turn that over uh, to Ruth, though. Okay, sure. Um, well, I just want to add one thing to what you just said, which is that it wasn't that long ago that there were lots of pro-immigration Republicans. Um, yeah. You might remember in the George Bush administration, there was a, it failed, but a serious attempt at immigration, a comprehensive immigration reform that he supported, that the, regime, the administration supported. And for that matter, in the last um, big immigration reform of 1986 occurred under Ronald Reagan. I remember being shocked by, um, I used to teach at UCLA where I had an, a student whose parents had come to the United States undocumented. Actually, I had many such students, but this one told me that her parents thought the best president the US had ever had was Ronald Reagan. Why? Because that's how they got legal status. <laughs> so this is not, this is a recent development what Justin just described. And, you know, sadly, the business interests that do support expansive immigration policies are very quiet about it. They, they will complain on the one side about in agriculture, for example, that they can't find workers. And at the same time, they might support Trump and the other, the rest of the so-called America first agenda. So it is a huge contradiction. Um, yeah. Well, I'll just add, I've worked with some of these businesses um, and some of the associations that they participate in, which have been in the past more vocally pro-immigrant, the, the immigration reform that passed in 1991 had a strong business coalition. Um, uh, and even rec as recently as 2013, when a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform passed the United States Senate with 68 votes, like remember when that was a thing that could happen? <laughs> um, that, that it also had strong business community support. What's really happening is that the, the, the folks who are, who 
acknowledge that they frankly need immigrants in the workforce and they want a more generous immigration policy are scared to death of the current political climate and fear lifting up their heads uh, and saying what they believe because of the backlash that will inevitably ensue. And that is um, a huge part of the reason that despite the fact that the majority of the country supports the kind of immigration reform that's been on the table now, you know, three or four times in the last 20 years, we can't get it over the finish line. And that, that's, that, it's not a policy problem. It's not a substance problem. It's not even a coalitional problem. It's a problem of Republican intransigence from beginning to end. It's a political problem. And if I could just offer a, a short rejoinder, I also think that consistent with what Cecilia just said, we, we know what policies are out there. You know, there's been tons of research out there. This is an issue that is no longer dictated by policy or substance. It's really driven by emotion. And in many ways, you know, this, this recent switch and realignment, um, and I would just, you know, Ruth and I may disagree about how fast it's been. I think it's actually been decades in the making because there's been so much baiting of, of either racist or nationalist or nativist uh, uh, rhetoric on the right um, that eventually Republicans were expected to actually deliver on some of these things rather than just use it to sort of stir people up, which is what um, people under the Bush administration and during Clinton, uh, the Republicans did then. Uh, it, was, it was a race to who could sound more nativistic and nationalistic, even though none of those actual policies were, were actually pursued until the Trump administration. And so when you whet the appetite of folks uh, for this kind of uh, for these kinds of ideas, eventually they're going to say, okay, well, are you going to deliver now? I want it. And that's what's happened. And I think it's so much of it is about fear, threat, you know, or um, sympathy and, and outrage. You know, that's what's driving immigration policy right now. It's not about, you know, oh, what can we do to advance the mission of this country, to advance our purpose, to strengthen us? That's not what people are talking about. That's why it's so important to change the conversation, although it's very difficult in the face of those you know, passions that, that you just described. I just want to mention something that um, appears in something Justin wrote a few years ago, a book called The New Minority, which studies, um, I think your term for them is post-traumatic industrial cities, like Youngstown, Ohio is the US example he talks about. And um, there, there's a tremendous amount of um, immigrant scapegoating and um, blaming immigrants for the plight of workers who once had, you know, so-called middle-class jobs in factories and those jobs have evaporated. And it's astonishing that in that situation where there's no logical way in which you could possibly attribute the closing of those factories to immigrants, there aren't hardly any immigrants in Youngstown, or at least not at the time that that book was written. So, and yet they, they, they are completely convinced that this is what's the problem. So it, it really does defy logic. And you know, I think you're right that there's a huge emotional you know, component and it's very easy to fall into, you know, to um, buy into a scapegoating kind of um, perspective, especially if you're hearing it every night on Fox News, which you know, we still are. Thank you. Um, Cecilia, I might turn this question to you. This is from Hassan, who wants to know what can or should be done to counter the anti-immigrant movement. So the sort of apparatus attached to Republicans, but not only Republicans really, um, who have been responsible for creating narratives of threat and invasion, specifically groups like FAIR, Center for Immigration Studies, Numbers USA. Yeah, so what's so interesting, I mean, this has been a conundrum for, I've been doing this more than 30 years. It's been a conundrum the whole time the sort of information about FAIR and the founder of FAIR, a, a myth, Michigan ophthalmologist named John Tanton, um, whose who's racist white supremacist views sort of led to his founding of both FAIR and then the Center for Immigration Studies starts as a project of FAIR. You have this kind of cascading set of organizations which all have the same origins, all have ties to white supremacy and they have dominated, they've been the voice of the sort of anti-immigrant side of the equation really for, for, for at least 30 years longer, 40. Um, and the information about the, the racist connection has been visible in the public eye since 19, about 1991, right? So we've known and been able to demonstrate who these folks are and where their views come from for a really long time. Um, and the upshot of all of that is that really is, is that the media who cite them don't care, right? It's not as if there weren't a lot of folks pointing that out and suggesting that it is not legitimate to paint an organization with a racist 
history with, that, who's, with racist origins as a neutral think tank that is merely anti-immigrant, that that is inaccurate, has largely fallen on deaf ears. You saw kind of a blip of recognition as the Trump administration um, emerged onto the scene and you started to see, right, you, you, the media started to recognize white supremacy for, for what it is. And in some cases got uncomfortable citing these sources, but mostly not, mostly it, they're, they're still dominating the, the conversation. So, you know, while I've spent, and many people have spent many years um, sort of elevating that this is illegitimate, we have not yet succeeded. Um, and, you know, for many years we were able to simply outwork them and build broader coalitions and succeed in moving things forward that they opposed. And obviously, the, the you know we are not in such a moment now, and the part a big piece of the reason for the political paralysis on immigration issues has to do with the fact that, as much as it pains me to say it, the sort of white supremacist view, the anti-immigrant view, is ascendant. It has been ascendant for a while, and has created the fear that you just heard us describe with respect to businesses, with respect to Republicans, including Republicans who used to be part of the coalition who were in some cases the primary authors of things like the DREAM Act, who no longer can bring themselves to support it or vote for it uh, on the floor because uh, the backlash is so strong. So, uh, you know, I, it, I, it's more of an explanation than an answer because collectively as a field, we have not figured out how to disempower organizations with explicit racist origins who continue to be cited as if they were merely good thinkers on the anti-immigrant side. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions here uh, addressing social cohesion as a concern in the crafting of immigration policy. And I might start with Justin, but everyone should feel free to jump in. Um, so one person um, citing, I think, observations by Eduardo Porter and other researchers um, notes that immigrants comprise less than 14% of the US population, which compared to other countries, many other countries is actually quite low. Is there a quote unquote acceptable percentage? And are there real concerns to be addressed regarding social cohesion, what it kind of means to be part of this policy? Justin? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, no, there is no such thing as an acceptable uh, share. Um, there's no evidence that when you pass a magical threshold, nativism abounds or anything like that. Um, what there is evidence of is that there is an acceptable pace of migration. So there's an acceptable pace of change. Um, what we see people reacting to is acute influxes, uh, which again, render the sense of the loss of control. And, uh, and, and that sense of control is really, I have found in my own research as well, uh, to be pivotal uh, to reactions uh, that are more anti-immigrant and more uh, restrictionist. Uh, and so I think we have to recognize that um, human beings broadly, uh, left and right, don't like lots of change all at once, which is you know, pretty normal. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so managing the situation, preparing the sort of soil, the ground uh, for, uh, the arrival of immigrants is just as important as ensuring their own success. Um, we have to think about both. We have to treat the arrivals, but also the natives who are already present uh, and making sure that everyone is comfortable. I think that's really key going forward. In terms of social cohesion, um, I think that the challenge that our country faces uh, is, a, is, a, is a challenge that uh, faces almost any country subject to intense demographic change, which is what we're witnessing now. Um, it's not that we have enormous amounts of immigrants here, it's that we have had persistent immigration over the last half century, and that that has altered quite literally the complexion of the country. Uh, and so the demographic change feels faster because of differential fertility rates, uh, rather than because of an influx of immigrants all of a sudden, because as you know, the, the questioner points out right correctly, um, we are not actually like Australia, which is at 30%, uh, double the, uh, the stock. Um, what we have to actually, what we, the challenge that we're facing is that these are countries, all of us are countries that were founded on a sense of identity that is related in some specific way to an ethnicity, a race, a religion, and some kind of sense of origin and heritage. And while the United States has a number of civic ideals from its founding, the practical de facto history of the country is of a white Protestant country. Uh, and that has primarily been a white Protestant country. And in, in, in our implicit understandings of American identity, that backdrop is there just the same way that 
you know, a, a white and Catholic country is at the, so, the core of, of Spain and, 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 and the settler states like uh, Australia or Canada. Um, it's not that uh, they're, in, they're inherently racist necessarily, it's just who lived there initially. Separating ourselves from that, uh, those ethno-racial, ethno-religious backdrops is really hard work because we have to identify the civic ideals that actually bring people together as a country. And I think that we can do that, but there has to be a sense of appetite uh, for, for doing so, for rethinking what it means to be an American. And there are a number of organizations and thinkers who are, who are uh, actively thinking about this right now. And, and I have a book on this subject uh, that's gonna be coming out in, uh, in spring next year called Majority Minority. And it's going to be a challenge really, I think of the next several decades of our country about how to rethink who we are. Uh, and I think it can't be about uh, any kind of sense of origin, but rather in the sort of sense of mission. What is our purpose? And we already have the fundamental um, uh, materials for that sense of mission. I think that everyone agrees that, that there is still something, it's flickering, but it's there about the American dream. And I think that there is also a sense of struggle that unites everyone as well. And I think that if we can leverage that shared sense of struggle, that shared sense of dream of working towards something that America is a project, then I think we'll be on our way to doing so. Can I challenge that a little bit? Um, I think in sure. general, I, I agree do. very much with the thrust of what you're saying. Although I would say that sort of the white Protestant thing, which is the story that we lean on and that we tell ourselves was, was ne never the, the whole truth. Um, if you look at, you know, the folks with names like mine were here in what is now the United States earlier. Um, and of course the whole Southwestern United States has a very, very different history. We just don't know it. We don't acknowledge it as a history of the United States and its people. And so our history is more complex and, and contains more diversity than we acknowledge. And in some ways that, that that's where the seeds are of, of the answer here, because we have in fact sort of come together around around a set of ideals, which is what makes us the, the, the United States over, with a lot of diversity for a very long time successfully. And that has been, I think it's a mistake to assume that our demographic change is a challenge to that because we have almost never had times when we didn't have demographic change. And there was a time when, you know, Benjamin Franklin was worried that we were all gonna be speaking German, for example. Concerns about social cohesion are as old as the United States is, but our ability to be one thing with our diversity is also as old as the United States is. And there's certainly times when we haven't been so good at it. You know, we are, we are in potentially such a time, but we also take great pride in the notion that, that we are unique on the planet um, in, in having this kind of diversity and still being one place and one people. We have always had to work at it that will continue to be true, but we have the capacity to be successful at it. And I think it's a mistake to suggest that because demographics are changing in a, in, in a, in a different way that is getting noticed or the numbers of people with names like mine are starting to exceed numbers of other kinds of people, that that is somehow a threat. It's not a threat, it's a continuation of the process that we've been undergoing now for hundreds of years. I just add a couple comments. I Thanks. really agree with what Cecilia just said. And, and also with Justin's point about the early history of the country, but let's not forget the, the first great wave of migration of Southern and East European immigrants. Um, they were greeted in exactly the same way as Latinos and Asians are now with great suspicion, racialization, et cetera. And, um, and now they consider themselves white and American in a fundamental way that they view people of color as not being. I remember as a kid coming home from school and reporting to my mother who was the kid of Russian immigrants, Russian Jewish immigrants, that um, we were taught to say in school, our forefathers came from England. And she laughed and she said, oh yeah, Beth McMillan, the one African-American kid in my class, her, her forefathers came from England. And later I realized how it was equally ridiculous to say it about me. But somehow that was the trope. Then it was all black and white as opposed to the multicultural, whatever people of color kind of categories that we have now. But we ourselves were, um, as you know, most people who are alive today, their, their grandparents or great grandparents were immigrants from somewhere else. So that's the other um, thing that could be leveraged and has been actually by the immigrant rights movement historically. But. I think that, you know, this is in some ways case in point of, of, of my argument, you know, it is precisely that each of those diverse waves of immigrants that have entered the country 
um, particularly historically in the 19th century and the early 20th century, it eventually assimilated into a sense of whiteness. The idea of what it means to be white in the United States has changed over time. It's no longer Anglo and, and Protestant necessarily. Right. And that is problematic because we still assign privilege to that whiteness and that whiteness still defines what the American mainstream is. So despite the diversity that you know, Cecilia and, 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 uh, and Ruth um, you know, properly point out, um, that has been a defining uh, component of the United States demographically. Um, it has been hidden by this sort of uh, innate and sort of, I should say inherent desire um, to, to, to move gravitationally towards the sense of whiteness that has defined who we are. And I think that's a really a principal challenge of our times as we try to actually bring ourselves to create a sense of cohesion with people who are ostensibly not white and may not want to be white. Uh, and that's gonna be very challenging. And, and that's hence the need for these civic ideals. Um, and if anyone's interested in this idea, I published a piece about a month ago in the New York Times, uh, it is an op-ed and uh, hopefully we can link it and, and share it. I think it's already actually in the chat. So everyone can double click on that and, uh, and actually see uh, uh, what I have to say in, in a little bit longer form. I would just add that this shows that not only, I said before in um, my presentation that immigration policy is entangled with labor market policy. Let's also, it's obvious, but I think it's a good note to wind things up on immigration and race are deeply inter, you know, interconnected and white supremacy is the target that we need to focus on as we um, try to move this agenda forward. Yeah, I would agree as someone who is not white and has no desire to be white, <laughs> does not necessarily feel a whitening pressure, but that certainly the, the sort of mythology of the US is, is as you've described. I would also maybe suggest that I think Native American um, thinking around kind of what immigration is and sort of what social cohesion is, has been quite useful to me in trying to understand what what uh, imaginative possibilities, at least for migration policy might be. Um, we are actually at the end of our hour. We have so many wonderful questions um, that we didn't get to. And I, I thank the listeners for those and I'll pass them on to the panelists. Um, but thank you so much to Cecilia and Justin and Ruth for your generous comments and your expertise and for putting together this wonderful guidebook for us all to, to engage with this much, much uh, further. And thank you to New America and the New Press. Uh, please do purchase the book at the link on your screen. Thank you all so much. Thank you.